And so I picked Penelope up, basically picked myself up <laughs> and moved, moved us into Penelope's room. And we sat on the floor cross-legged and I looked into Penelope's eyes and I asked this question, what's really wrong, baby? Why are you so angry? Just that, what's wrong and why are you so angry? And it was the, it was the million dollar question, Penelope opened up in a way I'd not seen ever, eyes filled with tears. And Penelope said the most like phenomenal words that I'd, I'd never even considered. Mama, everyone thinks I'm a girl and I'm not. I am a boy. Jody Patterson remembers sitting there on the ground with Penelope, who was just shy of three years old at the time. Jody was filled with a mix of emotions grateful that her child felt comfortable sharing his true gender identity with her, but also fearful of all the unknowns and changes that lay ahead for her son. What Jody didn't anticipate, however, were the changes she would undergo as well. If my daughter is actually my son, what else in the world don't I know? It felt like there was a lot that I had not learned. And so I went on the quest to learn more, and that learning not only gave me insight to my son and to the millions of trans people that exist, um, but also to myself. On today's show, a mother discovers herself after her son shows her how. I'm Maya Shunker, and this is A Slight Change of Plans, a show about who we are and who we become in the face of a big change. Jody Patterson grew up on New York's Upper West Side in a family of Black activists. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. named Jody's grandmother Miss Revolution for her work in the segregated South. Jody's uncle was a legendary poet and musician, Gil Scott Heron. Her father started the first Black brokerage firm on Wall Street, and her mother opened a private school for Black families in Harlem. Jody was surrounded from an early age by people who pushed against the status quo and she was eager to pass that ethos on to her own children. Today, Jody is mom to five kids. But we started our conversation by talking about what life was like for her just before Penelope, who now goes by Penel, arrived on the scene. Jody had two little kids already, a boy and a girl. And on paper, at least, her life was filling up with all of the things she had hoped for. We were um, living in the heart of New York City, in Soho, right? The heart of the heart of the world. We had a lot of resources, a lot of love. We had a beautiful home. We traveled a lot. And at the same time, it was a really confusing time. Really confusing time for me. I didn't know enough. <laughs> Not nearly enough. Yeah. What did you feel you didn't know enough about? Probably myself. I was still feeling unaccomplished unsure, not quite satiated. Like there was just a want for more and I couldn't put my hand on it. It definitely was not lack of love, but I still couldn't figure out why with all of this stuff that we had, beautiful, healthy children, um, beautiful access to the world, beautiful home, why I was feeling not quite full. Mm. When you first found out that you were pregnant with Penel, what dreams did you have for your baby? Well, I, um, from when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a mother. Uh, the three things I wanted to be were a mother, a businesswoman in a suit, <laughs> and a teacher. So having children was something that I've always wanted. And I was so excited to be pregnant for the third time. Um, I was also thinking, gosh, you're already so blessed. Maybe this, maybe there are no more blessings coming. So I was fearful that this wouldn't be a perfect baby. 
Hmm. Yeah, I know. It's one of those things I always think of. I, how can I be blessed again? How can God give me one more blessing? And so I'm always, I was very nervous around that. Um, and then I was excited because I really loved the two children I had. And I was expecting this one to be just as freaking phenomenal. So oh, the biggest feeling was um, excitement, I would have to say. And the doctor tells you that you're having a girl, right? Did you have any visions of what that would look like? <laughs> oh, I was so excited. Um, you know, I come from four girls. There are four of us. So I have three sisters. Uh, my mom has sisters. And I just love the women in our family. I was so excited to have a girl. I had all these girl names. Big sister Georgia was excited, sort of, <laughs> to have a, a sister. <laughs> A little jealous. She's like, you know, this could ruin my whole princess thing. <laughs> but um, this just the idea of all the rituals that we would be doing together. We did a lot of hair rituals in my family. Um, we did a lot of quiet, private time with just the girls and the women in my family. We have a lot of auntie celebrations with just women. So there was like this um, real anticipation of raising and spending time with and building up another strong, confident woman, because I think the world needs more of that. And so this was like, not only was I going to have another blessing in the family, but like another gift to the world, right? That's what I was yeah. thinking of. Yeah. It wasn't long before you realized that Penel was different from your other kids. When was the first time you realized that that something was up? So... You know, once we got home and brought baby Penelope home, um, Penelope was just bubbly. I mean, tons of smiles. Sometimes we'd, you know, Penelope would crawl up onto the um, dishwasher and like sit inside the dishwasher. There was just, Penelope was so phenomenal as a baby. Everything you would want to see, moving and physical and smiley and inquisitive, even as a little child. Um but I think the first time when I started to see that there was a energy in Pinnell that was not settled was around the first birthday. You know, you're, you're trying to learn so much about your kid in the beginning, your baby in the beginning. But by birthday number one, I knew something was different. Um, you know, Penelope was not comfortable with physical touch. So... Even putting on a diaper needed two parents. I'd have to just like call in for backup. We'd have to have people hold the baby down so that I, that mama and myself could put the diaper on. Penelope was not, a, at a certain point, became less snuggly with me. Penelope would push me away and say, no, mama, no. Um, I'm not talking to you, <laughs> which meant I'm not talking to you. Um, Penel wanted to be around big brother and dad way more than me. And I was not used to that. All my kids are really snuggly with me in the beginning. And so Penelope was rejecting mama, rejecting mama's touch. And then it became a little bit more layered than that. It would be rejecting dresses, rejecting hair brushing, rejecting certain shoes, rejecting toothbrushes. Penelope never wanted to use Penelope's toothbrush. Penelope wanted to use Big Brother's toothbrush. Same thing with diapers, shirts, jeans. So we had this toddler running around the house with Big Brother's clothes draping off of baby Penelope. And it was the only, those were the only things that could make Penelope happy. There was nothing that would soothe Penelope more than putting on Big Brother's t-shirt. Um, and then eventually, by the second year, Penelope was a bully at, at home and at the playground. So pushing siblings around, pushing kids at the playground, stomping, screaming. We did a whole year of just screaming, screaming, screaming. Then reoccurring nightmares. The monster's going to get me, mama. Then biting fingernails until the fingers are bloody. Um... You know, it was sort of, it was progressing more so than temper tantrum. You know, when you have a mother of multiples, temper tantrums don't get you. They don't f frazzle you too much. But this was much more than a temper tantrum. This was a heavy, heavy child. Mm. 
So most of that year, that second year was frustrating. We couldn't get out of the house. I couldn't get to work. I couldn't get the kids to school. Um, I was feeling very frustrated with my with the way I was mothering. I couldn't figure it out. I was trying to fix it, and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, you, you were in problem solver mode, right? Mm-hmm. I said more nap time, more love, more hugs and kisses, more story time. I even took out dairy. I said, maybe it's about the diet. Maybe this is all just a dairy allergy. Anything that I could think of, everything that my mom did that I thought was great parenting, everything that my grandmother did that I thought was great parenting, and nothing was working. So I was I was angry. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely understand that. And I would just feel so defeated, you know, because mm-hmm. um, you were so experimental with your approaches. A- at some point, you realize that while you're able to pacify Pinnell at times and force obedience at other times, there's perhaps something deeper going on because Pinnell still seems so troubled day to day, right? Yeah. And so there's this one night where you decide to engage differently, where, where you carve out some one-on-one time. Um, it was the summer, the end of the summer, and you know Penelope was just horrendous knocking over things, pushing Big Brother, screaming. And so I picked Penelope up, basically picked myself up (laughs) and moved us into Penelope's room and we sat on the floor cross-legged. And I looked into Penelope's eyes and I asked this question, what's really wrong, baby? Why are you so angry? Just that, what's wrong and why are you so angry? And it was the it was the million dollar question. Penelope opened up in a way I'd not seen ever, eyes filled with tears. And Penelope said the most like phenomenal words that I'd I'd never even considered. Mama, everyone thinks I'm a girl and I'm not. I am a boy. And what was your initial response to that? No words. I, I I really thought Penel was going to say, I hate you, the stupid family. <laughs> um, I, you know, this sucks. Something like very typical of a three-year-old, almost three-year-old. But f- when Penelope said, I am not a girl, I'm a boy. Wow. I just, uh, I, you know, uh, kind of stumbled. The way I'm stumbling now, I did not know what that meant. And then I quickly tried to pull some things out of the the, the mother Rolodex because I have great mothers to, to rely on. So I go into my mother Rolodex and I think, oh, 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 okay. She, this is my thought, she is a feminist. She is tough. She wants to be seen like her brothers. Oh, I get it. She's like, um, she's going to be maybe a lawyer. <laughs> These are the things I'm thinking literally in, in split seconds. Um, I thought that in, the, in those split seconds that I was dealing with a girl who wanted to be seen as tough, a girl who recognized the inequality in this world and didn't want to have second best, wanted to be seen as lead character. And so I, you know, almost like raised the the, the fist in solidarity with this girl that I thought I was looking at. And you said that you felt this was a parenting failure. Can you say more about that? I grew up with great stories of great women. Um, Shirley Chisholm, Billie Jean King, Nina Simone, Maya Angelou was our neighbor. And those stories of those women helped me to be this woman. And those stories are a part of my story. And so I was really excited to have my my daughters raised around um, powerful women. And so I thought, oh shit, did I not tell the Shirley Chisholm story to Penelope? Did I not raise this kid on all of the strong, bold women that have changed America for the better? And I was thinking, oh, maybe I didn't tell enough of the stories of women and aunties and that female perspective that is so important, that female energy. Um, you know, I, I I thought I had dropped the ball on feminism. And therefore, this girl didn't want to be a girl. Hmm. Um, 
and I was also thinking of it from a um, self-centered perspective, as most of us do, right? It's also like very typical. This is something to do with me. Pen- what Penel is saying about him is really about me. So when Penel says, I don't want to be a woman, I'm thought, thinking, what did I do? to set up this child. Yeah, why does he not want to be well, like me? Why don't me? you want to be like me? Exactly. <laughs> um, I thought my life was pretty darn good as a black woman. You know, a lot of people think differently. Like they, I don't know, maybe maybe folks think that um, black woman is bottom of the barrel. I'm actually, <laughs> and the women in my family actually think of it as the epitome. We want to be black women. We are excited to be black women. And so when this black child said, I'm not a girl and I don't want to be a woman, I thought I had failed. And I said, you know, however you feel inside, baby, it's fine. If you feel like your brothers, go ahead and act like your brothers. And so I said, look, you know, you're perfect the way you are. Your body is perfect. You are phenomenal. And that, that, that language was, was absolutely not landing well on Penelope. When I said, your body is perfect and you are perfect and I love you just as you are, he looked at me again with this anger because I wasn't getting it. You know, when someone doesn't see you and you're trying so hard to con- to explain yourself to them, he gave me one more shot and he said, mama, no, I don't feel like a boy. I am a boy. And that was the last, that was, you know, that was, I had to get it on that point. I had to get it. To not get it at that, in that moment would have been so many backward steps. I, I, in that moment when he said, I don't feel like a boy, I am a boy. What I did know was that we were talking about something more than an emotion. It was an identity that we were talking about. Hmm. And so once Penelope said, I don't, feel like a boy, I am a boy. I really just listened for a long time. I mean, we must have been in that room for about an hour or so. And Pinnell really just told me about how he saw life, how he felt inside, what he was experiencing, none of which I knew. He said, Mama, um, I love you, but I don't want to be you. I want to be Papa. Um, He said, I don't want tomorrow to come because tomorrow I will look like you. I want a doctor to make me a peanut. Mama, can a doctor make me a peanut? Here's a kid who was very aware. His body at that time was the culprit. At that moment, at almost three, Pinnell's body was the enemy. And I understood how deep that was. And I understood how painful that must feel. Um, But he was confiding in me, which was the most beautiful thing, the most courageous thing. He confided in me and he said, will you help me, mama? Um, And I said, yes. Saying yes was a yes, an overarching yes. It wasn't yes to any one particular next step because I didn't know what the hell, (laughs) what what the hell were the next steps, but I was saying yes to him, yes to his life. Yeah, yeah. Um, When we were talking, when I was listening to him, there was a um, a river behind us and it was moving with such depth and the force of the river that I could hear felt like the urgency of the life in front of me. It was a connection that I'll never forget. And Penelope talking about his life, it was, it was happening. It wasn't like I could stop Penelope being who he was. It was in motion and he needed me to be with him in motion. And then it struck something in me that um, was so primary that if I had not said yes to Penelope, I would have been saying no to even myself. That, That moment when your child is you, is life. And there's no half stepping. (laughs) You just got to go all the way. You cannot um, tiptoe. And so I jumped in. We'll be right back with a slight change of plans. I'm talking with Jody Patterson, 
a mother, activist, and author of the book, The Bold World, a memoir of family and transformation. Her son, Pinnell, came out to Jody as transgender more than a decade ago, when he was nearly three years old. I wanted to know what the days and weeks were like for Jody after that pivotal moment with Pinnell. There's so much um, crying that is that comes with this. Like when you raise a kid who's different, um, the, the the nonstop angst of a parent is is real. So I was, you know, spending a lot of time on the couch crying, spending a lot of time in the bed crying. Um, and it was getting to the point where it was overriding other things, overriding my ability to be there for all the children, be there for my husband, be there for the daily tasks that needed to get done. And so one day I was sitting on this couch, <laughs> on my couch, just crying. I mean, like really sobbing, curled up um, in a ball. The kids were at school. And my my sister friend, who was like an auntie to the children, was sitting on the couch next to me. And she usually just let me do what I you know, needed to do, which was cry. But this one day in particular, she just looked at me calmly um, and quietly, but very clearly said to me, you know, Jody, big girls, we cry and type at the same time. <laughs> you know, I, and as I looked at her because it was, first of all, I'd never heard anything like it. So it wasn't like, you know, a, a catchphrase. Big girls cry and type at the same time. And 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 it took a second, but she never explained it. I just understood it. So it, it's a phrase that comes at a time. It's a Southern phrase. And it probably was, you know, birthed when women were typing on typewriters and were asked to do things at the desk, assisting people on typewriters. But they were also activists. They were also mothers. They were also leaders in their community. And they had a lot to be pissed off about, a lot to be scared about. And so you have to get through the day, but you're going to cry and type at the same time. And remember, this is 10 years ago. So we don't have, we didn't have the understanding of the language. We didn't have trans icons living. We didn't have Janet Mock, we didn't have Pose, we didn't have any of the understanding. So the next several weeks, which turned into several months, which turned into many months, I just typed away at my computer and Google transgender. And then I would scroll through anything that came up, whether it was like doctors in the field, hypotheses, theories, you know, um, peer groups, parent organizations, um, that those, those weeks of just like exploring the, the World Wide web were, um, dark in a sense, because they were mostly at night. I was hiding away from everyone. It's a strange time, strange time, very, um, very, very inward. I didn't have a network of people then to talk to. And then some, in some moments I would have these like moments of like light, like total optimism. And I, and I stumbled upon a video of this little girl named Jazz, who was a young trans kid at the time, little girl. And I just deep dived into her story and her family. You organized a family movie night around Jazz's story, right? Yeah. We're sitting on the couch and it's, you know, a few, I think three of the youngest kids, um, and we're watching Jazz's family really just be proud to be a trans family. Um, and Jazz is being bubbly and, you know, so outgoing and she's loving being a trans kid. And Pinnell looks at me for the first time and says, Mama, I'm trans too, like Jazz. Mama, I'm trans like Jazz. First time, first time ever putting word to how he was inside and how he is as a person. And it was this kid, you know, that he saw on the computer. Just, it just, you know, this is why representation matters. It's like a catchphrase, representation matters. And then when you actually realize that the only time your kid has seen themselves on a screen is once and it lights your kid up, you want that. You want more of that. Yeah. You're navigating this moment where you're trying to educate yourself on everything there is to know about being transgender. You're also 
protecting your child, right? And and you're trying to bring others in the family on board. What what inspires you, Jody, to to get to action on all, in all this? Like fear, anxiety, complete um, and utter like gut wrenching fear. I am terrified, um, and that energy is absolutely understandable. Um, it is earned skepticism of this country, of these politics, of these folks in, in, in official positions to make laws. Um, I am, and that, that, so that energy of fear is natural and normal and actually a healthy response to the environment. And I turn that energy into activism. So I don't, um, it's not that I'm not scared. <laughs> it's not that I don't think about folks that are killing Black trans people. Um, but I, I take that that um, inner fear and I turn it into outward action. And you very quickly become Pinnell's lead supporter and advocate when it comes to getting the family and community on board with his his true gender identity. Um you, you craft letters to your community and you have Pinnell participate in that process. C- can you tell me more about what that experience was like and and how it changed your relationship with Pinnell, if it did change it? It did. You're right. I mean, it's funny. I just, I didn't think about it being a turning point in our relationship. But when you say it that way, it actually was. We became partners in the sense that we were working towards a shared common goal. You know, usually it's like top-down authority, parent sets the agenda, and the kids, until you, you know, finish college, you're going along with your parents' agenda more so than not. And so this was the first time when Penelope and I, when my child and I were going on a path that it was a shared agenda, and actually an agenda that the child had set. There's a moment when the kid takes a lead because only the only the individual self knows itself. So I allowed that understanding of what the goal was to be set by Penelope, and then I navigated the details of that. And so it looked like, you know, writing a letter to the family, announcing Penel is a boy, um, asking for their respect and their love and their support, and also stating that if they weren't ready to give those things, love and support, then they could take their time and and get back to us when they were ready. Um, But there would be no misgendering or miss, um, that we wouldn't be responding or acting um, in the way we used to act with Penel. This was a a new day. So I wrote a letter to the family. Penel signed the letter and edited the letter and addressed the, the envelopes and put the stickers on, the stamps on, sometimes even hand delivering those letters to people. Um, and he was really proud of that letter. Go him. Yeah. Go little rock star. <laughs> <laughs> you you had mentioned, Jody, that there were there were dark times because you didn't have a lot of people that you could talk to about this, especially in those early weeks and months. And part of your process for creating a safe environment for for Pinnell and for you, right? What it was was to deepen your connection to the transgender community. What did you what did you learn from that from that process? I mean, the biggest takeaway from that time for me is that, you know, our worlds are small, our friend groups are tiny, and they typically reflect who we are. So when I looked at my friends, I had mostly black female women, mother friends. To me, that was like that. That was that was doing <laughs> that was doing it. You know, if you and I was raised this way that you rely on your black community um, because most of the learning, most of the success, most of the tenacity, creativity, art, culture, language is going to come from the black community. You know, just look through history. And then when I, when I realized that that friend group did not reflect the reality of my family, I thought, well, this is ridiculous. And I had not one trans friend. I had not one, you know, gender nonconforming friend that I knew of. And so I took it a bit further and said, like, who's in my chosen family? Who's in my community? And no one reflected my son. And that that really disgusted me because I was essentially telling myself that Pinnell was the only trans person in the world. 
And again, that deepens your fear as a parent. If your child is the only person in the world that is like themselves. And so I said, you know, it's important to go outside of your little box. And so I went into, um, you know, this mode of like just spreading out in the world and really stretching, like physically just stretching out and touching all of the world. And that looked like Googling transgender um, conferences, LGBT conferences, queer conferences. I literally drove to conferences. I flew to conferences. I sat and I listened for the first year. I went back the next year, sat and listened. Um, I joined parent groups. Um, I took our family to a par- a family trans sleepaway camp. <laughs> Um, the whole family went. I mean, there's, you know, there are endless ways to to get to stretch out. And I was really intentionally doing that. So so it's been over a decade, Jody, since you had that conversation with Pinnell about his true gender identity. How have things been for Pinnell? How have things been for you since then? Um, what's what's changed for both of you and and what's stayed the same? Hmm. Oh, wow. What stayed the same? You know, it's, it's, um, when I first, that, that moment on the floor 10 years ago, when Pinnell said, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy. I really thought the world flipped upside down. I thought there's nothing, nothing normal, nothing good even is going to come from this. Um, since then I, I, I clearly see things differently. But what's interesting is that he he literally is the same kid. I mean, you know, I didn't... So what what is consistent is that Penelope is the person I birthed. You know, the pronouns have changed. The clothing has changed. The happiness has grown. But essentially, the character, the spirit of Penelope is consistent. Penelope back then did not have to disappear for Penelope today to come. I just had to shift and the world just had to shift. So the consistency is that I did not lose a child. Consistency is that the child I birthed is the child who is now a a really fantastic teenager. Um, Yeah. And that was important to me because, you know, you don't want to lose anything. Definitely don't want to lose a child, even in like theory. Yes, I understand that. And I didn't. Yeah. So that's an amazing thing to me to look and say, God, you're just just like that little baby that was crawling into the dishwasher, you know, <laughs> crawling <laughs> on like countertops and stuff, inquisitive and happy. Um, what has changed? You know, I lost, uh, I shifted out of a lot of relationships when I understood my son to be trans. Huh, say more. Well, you know, when... I had this question that was that was swirling around in my head. If my daughter is actually my son, what else in the world don't I know? It felt like there was a lot that I had not learned. And so I went on the quest to learn more. And that learning not only gave me insight to my son and to the millions of trans people that exist, um, but also to myself. I was able to be as bold as I was telling my son to be. This woman... <laughs> was able to be bold as well. Um, and that's that's probably the biggest thing that has changed um, my, my um, the way I interact with people is different. And because of that, I had to leave relationships. I left a marriage. Mm. Um, you know, I left some, some friendships in the form that they were in because they no longer fit um, who I was showing up as. You know, I felt like I was preaching a really important slogan, be bold, step into a room, let people know who you are, hold your chin up, you know, tell people who they, who you are so that they can adjust. I was telling that to a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, be bold. And this 40-year-old woman was not as bold. So like I was feeling, you know, it was a little, it was a little hypocritical that I was demanding this of a five-year-old and not of the 40-year-old the woman. And so I began to, to, um, 
turn the mirror to myself. How bold are you? How much of your inner identity is shown to the public, shown to your intimate spouse, shown to your children? How much are you acknowledging, Jody, that you are not meant to be a supporting character? <laughs> You know, I, I had supported, I, you know, and, and moms will understand this. We are supporters. And in particular, I, I have a very, um, I can, I can be very submissive and very accommodating. Those are things that are within me and I don't reject them now, but they don't dominate. And I'm also a lead character and I'm also someone who's going to set a tone. And I'm also someone who has a vision. And so I took a, a different approach to the parenting model that I was doing. And so now not just supporting and nurturing, I am also leading the um, the family. I wasn't doing that then. <laughs> not at all. And when, once I said, you know, F it to a lot of things and a lot of uh, demands on me and a lot of people, when I started saying no, my career changed. I, I narrowed it into something that I really like, which is writing. I love to write. So I've written two books. I um, took a leap and joined a board of the Human Rights Campaign. And I took another leap and asked them to elect me as the chair of the foundation board. And I, I got that honor. So places where I would not have inserted myself, yeah, I now insert myself. Doing things that are still really challenging because I've never done them before, but I'm doing them. <laughs> I got that. I got that from Pinnell. Like he would literally, I remember watching Pinnell um, in karate. So he was a, he is, um, he's been doing karate for years and he goes to karate tournaments and he was competing obviously in the boys section, boys, you know, 10 and up. So like 10 and 13 year olds are competing together. And I would just like be terrified for him. You know, my my brain was kicking in like, oh, my God, is, is he really going to show up like these boys, right? Is he really going to be enough for these boys? Is he really boy enough was probably what was going through my head. And I was watching him and he said, Mama, one day, he said at the beginning of his match, Mama, don't be scared. I'm not scared. Oh. <laughs> so he's going into the ring, right? Not scared. Yeah. Knowing he may win or he may not win. And so now I kinda, I go into these arenas knowing I may or may not be the best, but I'm going to go into them. That came from him. Wow. Oh, man. Um, you mentioned earlier in our conversation when we took the, that time machine back to the period of your life where where your story with Pinnell was just beginning that that you didn't feel full, that, that your life had had what you thought were the right ingredients to feel full, but, but you didn't feel full. And so I, I want to know whether you feel full now. <laughs> Fuller. <laughs> no, I, you know, yeah, I, so here's the interesting thing. I really did have a, a deficit in my soul, I think. Um, I was feeling empty. My emptiness was because I had a false expectation. The false expectation was get good grades, go to a good school, marry a good man, and it's going to be okay. <laughs> I know that sounds very simplistic and I'm, no, you know, I get it. like I had the same dream. You know what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> yeah, like in, totally. it's intellectually, you know, better, but really I was doing the steps that I thought were good in life. And I thought I was going to have a quote unquote good life. And it wasn't, it wasn't matching. And I think I, I needed to um, break out of those four corners just as much as Pinnell did. And so now, you know, look, I do love marriage. I do love relationship. I do love children. And I do love being, you know, chosen to be the chair of the human rights campaign. But I don't use that to measure the value and the validity of this woman. The, what, I'm, what I'm using now as like, are you doing a good job, Jody? is how much of this world are you touching? Like how much are you experiencing? What don't you know? Go learn some more. And so that is a very fulfilling place to be because you can ingest this world. You can take it in and never accomplish a million dollars, right? And still feel fulfilled. As, as Bob Marley says, I'm rich in life. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching my kids and watching them do life and I'm taking cues from them. That's something new.
Hey, thanks for listening. Join me next week when I talk to the religious scholar Kate Bowler. She's an expert on the prosperity gospel, which preaches that if you have a strong faith in God, you deserve health, wealth, and happiness. Kate never believed in this idea of people deserving things, or so she thought, until a stage four cancer diagnosis revealed otherwise. I spent years studying people who believe that they deserve what they get. And I I never once imagined myself to be that kind of person. And then when I could hear myself saying, but aren't I kind of a good person? It was like that, that bit was so deeply humbling. And I realized like, oh, things, things come apart. A Slight Change of Plans is created, written, and executive produced by me, Maya Shunker. The Slight Change family includes Tyler Green, our senior producer, Emily Rostek, our producer and fact checker, Jen Guerra, our senior editor, Ben Tolliday, our sound engineer, and Mia LaBelle, our executive producer. Luis Guerra wrote our theme song, and Ginger Smith helped arrange the vocals. A Slight Change of Plans is a production of Pushkin Industries, so big thanks to everyone there including Nicole Morano, Maggie Taylor, Eric Sandler, Heather Fain, and Carly Migliori. And of course, a very special thanks to Jimmy Lee. You can follow A Slight Change of Plans on Instagram at Dr. Maya Shunker. So like, uh, what did you have for breakfast, Jody? I had um, <clears throat> breakfast was tea. <laughs> and I had a red velvet cupcake. Um, I think that was it. I usually have like an avocado with egg and sprouts. It just didn't happen today. Okay. Yeah. This is a no judgment zone, by the way. We just need <laughs> audio quality. You can eat whatever the hell you want.